as I was worshiping, I had a vision as I was down here. And in my vision, I saw someone going in for surgery. I saw someone going in for surgery. And how many of you guys know, you ever had surgery before? Surgery is serious business. Surgery is a very serious business where you go into a hospital and you're put under anesthesia and doctors come in and perform a surgery on you. And we take that very serious. You know, we take that very serious. You know, we ask for our friends and our relatives and our loved ones to pray for us because it's a very serious moment that we mark on the calendar and, and we know it's very serious nature. Well, friends and family, when you come to church on Sunday morning, you're going in for surgery. You're going in for surgery. This morning, you are coming into the great physician's surgical room and he's gonna operate on your heart of all places. This ain't a foot surgery. This ain't a hand surgery. This is a heart surgery. So that's, you're coming in for heart surgery, I'm coming in for heart surgery, and we're asking the great physician to come and work on our hearts. So before I proceed any further, man, I just wanna pray for you guys that the words that we look at in scripture this morning will do heart surgery. We have open hearts, we have semi-open hearts, and we have closed hearts. And what, I can't change your heart, but the Holy Spirit can. So we need the Spirit of God. We need the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to come in and do what only He can do as the great physician works on our hearts and we study the word. So please join with me in prayer and say, Lord, do, work, do a work this morning on my heart like only you can do. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are the great physician. And Lord, I pray for our hearts this morning, Lord, that you'll open our hearts. God, we're not here for tradition or religious duty. We're here to, for heart surgery. This, this is that morning we're going in for surgery. So, Lord, please open our hearts. Holy Spirit, do your work in our hearts this morning as we study your word. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, Lord God. All God's people said, amen, amen. I feel like, I feel like the Lord's going to do a great thing in our hearts this morning. And I'm pumped and I'm excited. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. And Miss Stephanie will bring you a Bible. Please turn in your Bibles this morning to Jude. To Jude. We're going to finish the book of Jude this morning. I'm, I'm super excited. So let's, let's, let's read Jude verses 12 through 15. 12 through 15. This is what the, scripture, the, the word of the Lord says in, in Jude 12, verses 12 through 15. It says, These are men who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, deeply, excuse me, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father, as we study it now, we're on the operating table. Please do your surgery that only you can do. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, Father. All God's people said, amen. 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 The book of Jude. We've been studying it now. This is our third week. We're going to finish it, as I said. Uh, the book of Jude is a shot across the bow. It's, it's a shot across the bow. It's a warning sent out across the landscape of Christianity to every pastor, every teacher, and every leader. If you use Christianity... For your own self-interest, your own fame or fortune, judgment will come. God's judgment will come. Because Christianity is God's program. 
It's, it's his program. The gospel is his plan of salvation. The Bible is not our word. It is his word. And you and I are called by the instruction of the book of Jude to contend because it's his word. It's not our word. We just join in. We just get on the train. We just become a born-again Christian. We become followers of Christ, and we pursue him, and we contend for the faith. We protect it, and we defend it. So the title of my message this morning is Guarding Yourself from Apostasy. Now, if you were with us last week, we talked about the false teachers and the apostasy last week. And we're going to continue that discussion, picking it up at, at verse 12 through 19. But then once you get to verse 20 in Jude, Jude shifts and he talks to the believers and he says, this is how you guard yourself from falling away. This is how you guard yourself from apostasy. This is how you guard yourself from false teaching. So that's what we're going to see. Why do people fall away? Why do people fall away in this world? Friends and family, the deception today is like a tidal wave. It's like a tsunami. It's like a tsunami sweeping across our land, deceiving people. And people fall away and they are deceived because they buy the lies of Satan. The very one that's the enemy of their soul that wants to deceive them, that wants to destroy them, they have bought his lies. And they have, they, they have bought the deception and believed the deception of the ungodly world. Paul said in Colossians 2, chapter 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the things of man rather than on the things of Christ. Christian, you've got to be alert. You've got to be alert in your walk with Christ or else you can fall prey to deception. I can fall prey to deception. If my eyes are not on Christ and my life is not focused on, this wor on, on his word, some people, you know, I hear some people in their pride say, well, I can't be deceived. You can't deceive me. Nothing gets past me. I know right and wrong. I know truth from error. I, I, I cannot be deceived. Let me, let me present this to you this morning. Spell the word silk. What do cows drink? <laughs> cows do not drink milk. They drink water. But when we hear things and we process things in our minds, we don't always hear it and think it all the way through. And we think something wrong about something that's actually true. Give you one more. Put your thinking caps on. Ready? How many of each animal did Moses take on the ark? I heard a couple of them out there. Moses didn't take any. Noah did. But, but we have to be careful. We have to be alert. We have to think and, and, and understand what the scripture says or else we'll, we'll, we'll fall into deception. Because, let's, let's face it, human beings were prone to deception. You're prone to deception, I'm prone to deception. It's part of the fall. When we say we're all sinners, you know, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and we all have, we've all sinned and, and violated his law, but we also have the tendency to fall away and to fall into deception. So let's look this morning at Jude's description of false teachers verses 12 through 19, and then we'll pick up the title of my message in verse 20 where it talks about how to guard yourself from apostasy. So here's Jude's description of the false teachers of his day, and there's nothing new under the sun. They're still around. Verse 12 says, These are the men who are hidden reefs. In your love feast, when they feast with you without fear. So the first description that Jude gives us of uh, these apostates, these false teachers, he says, he speaks that they are, they are hidden dangers. In other words, they're like jagged rocks right up under the surface of the water that you can't see when you're going across the lake. Any of you guys ever fished at Santee? You have to be very careful when you're fishing at Santee because there are stumps all up under the water. And you have to follow the designated routes. If you just start shooting across that clear water, you're liable to lose your prop because of, because of the stumps up under. Me and Daniel like to go fishing on Lake Murray. And the last time we went fishing, we put in 
at about 4.45 a.m. It was pitch black at the Lake Murray Dam. We put our boat in the water, and we had to maneuver about two and a half, three miles to our favorite spot. And getting to our favorite spot, we had to go between islands. So here I am at 5 a.m. All you guys are sleeping in, in bed, and I'm out there on Lake Murray. I got Daniel up on the bow of the boat with a big old high beam flashlight. And I'm like, Daniel, you keep looking ahead as we're going between these islands. We don't want to hit anything. Sometimes there's floating debris. Sometimes there's, 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 there's broken pylons out there, and there's other things. So we have to be careful. And because what will they, they will do? They will sink my boat. And I don't want to go down on Lake Murray. Friends and family, false teachers will sink your ship. They, they, will, they will take you down. They will take you down. False teachers will shipwreck your faith. They'll hijack you. And they'll pull you away from the Bible. And they'll deceive you. Then he says, um, after he says that they are, they are hidden reefs, talking about their the, the unseen danger, he says, caring for, verse 12, caring for themselves, their clouds without water, carried along by the winds. What does this speak of concerning false teachers and apostates? It speaks of their empty promises. Their empty promises. When a farmer sees a cloud, what does it mean? It means rain is on the way. And when it doesn't produce what, what happens? It's a huge letdown for the farmer. He sees the clouds. He sees his crops. They need rain. The clouds come. They don't produce rain. It's a huge letdown. And it's the same with false teachers. False teachers, they claim to have living water. But in reality, they have nothing. They're like big fluffy clouds. They're all vapor and no water. The word of God is living water for our souls, okay? False teaching is not living water. It's, it's acid, it's, it's poison. But the word of God is the living water. But they're clouds without water. They're, they're just vapor, they're just mist. And, and they bring nothing of value. Then he says in verse 12, uh, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted. Uh, false teachers, they're, they're, they're like dead rotted wood. What, what good is dead, rotted wood? Nothing. It's not good for burning. It's not good for building. It serves no good purpose. And it says, notice the autumn trees there, without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. So both ends of the, of the uh, false teacher, both ends of the rotted wood are no good. There's no fruit in their life. There's no fruit of Christianity, but also there's no root. There's no root in their life. Why? Because their message is not grounded in the word of God. Their message is not grounded in Christ, in Christ alone. That's what, we, what he is saying to us this morning. Let's continue. Verse 13. Verse 13, he says, Wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. This speaks of the false teacher's destructive nature. Their destructive nature. They're like storm waves. And what does a storm wave do when it comes up onto the ocean or comes up onto the beach? All it does is it just stirs up the dirt. It just stir, stirs up the dirt and it creates a mess. They're like a tsunami. They're like a tsunami. We remember, what was it, 2003, 2004 when those tsunamis hit, hit the shores of, of India? It created a lot of damage. It destroyed homes and, and people's lives and it killed a lot of people. And the same thing can be said of false teachers. They're like a tsunami. They're like a wild wave of the sea. And the only thing they bring is destruction. Jesus said in John chapter 8, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay? Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, brings freedom, brings forgiveness, brings liberty, brings joy, brings happiness, brings holiness. False teaching does none of those it just brings you into bondage. That's why Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is what brings freedom. This is what brings joy. This is what brings us into a right relationship with the Lord. And we're not destroyed by it. The word of God does not destroy you. It builds you up. 
That's what the Spirit of God does. The Scripture says that the, uh, the, word, the sword of the Spirit is what? The Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses this sword to operate on our hearts and bring us liberty, bring us freedom, bring us joy, bring us forgiveness, and brings us life. Jesus said, I came to give them life and life more abundantly. Verse 13, he continues. The next phrase there, uh, you know, these phrases are pretty cool, pretty amazing. When you read them, they, they bring all kind of things to mind. So I imagine when you were looking at it this week as you were preparing for this Sunday morning teaching, I would love to hear after service some of your thoughts because these phrases, the, the word pictures are pretty cool. They're pretty amazing. But the next one is in verse 13. It says, they're wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. The, the wandering stars, what's the one characteristic of a wandering star? I, I, when I read this, I'm thinking of a shooting star. What is it? It does not last. A, a, a wandering star does not last. So this speaks of how the wandering star does not last, and neither does a false teacher. A false teacher is like a shooting star. They flash across the sky. They make people say, wow, did you hear him? Did you hear what was said? And, and they mesmerize people. But then they disappear. They disappear and they're gone. And such as false teachers, it can be very charismatic. It can have a huge wow factor. It can make you think, wow, that is cool. That is new teaching. And you're like, whoa, check this out. But friends and family, there is no new teaching. The word of God has been given to us once and for all to contend, to fend, to study. And I'm going to tell you, I've been studying the scriptures for 30 years now, okay? And I learn new stuff every week, okay? As you study the, the scriptures, as you break out your commentaries, as you look up the Greek words, and you dive into the, 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 the verses of scripture, man, you can learn new things every week. And my point in saying that is, from the time we're born to the time we step into eternity, we will still not have had enough time to learn everything the scripture teaches. It's like a treasure. It's like a treasure. You open it up and you just keep digging through and you just keep digging through and you learn new things as we study it in context and as we look at what it says. It's amazing. There, we don't need no new teaching. The scripture and the scripture alone is the eternal, enduring word of God. Where was I at? Verse, verse 14. Verse 14, he says, It was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So here we're introduced to Enoch. Who was Enoch? Enoch was a mighty man of God, a descendant of Seth, the text says. And the most important verse you can know about Enoch from the Old Testament is Genesis 5.24, where it says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Interesting, uh, Enoch was like a picture of the rapture. It was like a picture of the rapture. He was walking with the Lord, and the Lord snatched him up to heaven. So God will do the same thing with the body of Christ. He will snatch them up to heaven in the rapture of the church. What's interesting here is uh, if you're a student of the Bible and you like studying the Word, you know, you, you're, you're thinking, okay, why is, what's up with this? Now he's, he's, quoting, he's quoting here from the book of Enoch. But what I want you to notice is he's not saying here in this text that the book of Enoch is inspired scripture, okay? He's just simply saying what Enoch, prophet, he's simply saying what Enoch prophesied and that it's true, okay? Prophecy, prophetic words, the, the, the working of prophecy has, has operated outside the realm of scripture. We see that in the book of, the book of Acts with Agabus and, and we see that with Enoch. We see that with other people, but it's not saying that the book of Enoch is inspired. He's just saying that what Enoch said in that apocryphal book that was written about him, what he prophesied is true. And what, but the 
point of the passage is, what is Enoch's prophetic word? What is Enoch's prophetic word that he's saying? His prophetic word is this, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will return and judgment will take place. Christ will return and judgment will take place. Friends and family, we got to be careful. we got to be careful of preachers who preach that God is a God of love and not judgment. we got to be careful of the preachers who say that God will never condemn no one, that no, that no behavior can be called ungodly, that unconditional love means God places no demands on his children. That is just simply not true. J.I. Packer said, In his uh, devotional book he wrote in the 80s, I think it was 86 or 87, he said in his devotional called Your Father's Love for You, he says, these men are loved and accepted by the masses, yet in reality they are self-serving. They lull people into a false sense of security. They don't prepare people to stand before God. They are unfaithful and unqualified men. We have a dual message, family. We have a dual message for the world. And the message is salvation is in Christ. You can can find complete forgiveness in Christ. You can have a restored life in Christ, okay? You can be saved, delivered, healed with a clear mind and a clean heart. And that's the amazing truth of the gospel. But if you reject Christ, if you reject Christ, you will face judgment, you will face the severe judgment of God because there's only one way to salvation and that's through the cross. That's through the cross. So our message, um, like Enoch here, is not just a message of salvation, which is what we present to the world. But man, if you reject this kind offer of salvation, there's only one thing that's left and that's judgment. And the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. God is holy, and he is just, and he is right, and he will punish all sin. Okay, He will deal with all sin. He will hold every single one of us accountable. But he's given all of humanity uh, a ticket to forgiveness, a ticket to be forgiven, for the slate to be, to be, be wiped clean, and that is through the cross, through the cross. But apart from the cross, judgment awaits those who do not put their trust in Christ and, 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 and embrace the ungodly world and not embrace Christ. Continuing on in verse 16, he says, these are, talking about the false teachers of his day, he says, these are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of, of gaining advantage. Jude's message is crystal clear in this, in this text. Pastors and teachers who love money, sex, and power and neglect the teaching of God's word will incur a severe judgment. Why? Because they are ruled by the flesh. Okay? I can't say that any clearer. Because they are ruled by the flesh. We are called to be a spiritually minded people. Think about it. You know, I'm hoping for 90. I'm hoping for 100 years. Maybe maybe I'll see some great grandkids and some great, great grandkids. And I want to live a long life. But I'm, but I'm not promised. That's time. But beyond that is eternity. Okay. So we need to make sure our, the things of eternity are set in place even before the things of this life. That's the, the like my level of commitment. Because God is eternal and his kingdom is eternal. Well, my commitment is to him first. Okay? I make him number one. Then after that is my wife. I'm committed to her for the rest of my life. So she's number two. Then my family. Then church members and and people. But we got to prioritize. We got to prioritize. And I don't know how I got off on that. (laughs) But uh, verse 16. Let's go back to verse 16. Oh, I was talking about they were ruled by the flesh, and we have to be ruled by the Holy Spirit and live with an eternal perspective. That was my point. Thank you, mind. Anyway, thank you, Holy Spirit. But uh, Jude is drawing a line here. He's drawing a line looking at verse 16. He's drawing a line between false teachers and Christians. The false teachers, let's, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's do a little comparison in our minds looking at verse 16. False teachers, what's the first thing it says they do? 
The NASB says they grumble. They grumble. That's just not even a nice word. They, they grumble. When I think of the word grumbling, I think about somebody I don't want to be around. Okay? Where on the flip side of that, a Christian, you and I, friends and family, believers, we're not grumblers. We're thankful. We're thankful to the Lord for all of his bounty, for all of his blessings. We're thankful for salvation. We're thankful for his word. We're thankful for our family. We live thankful lives. We live thankful lives. And we are not grumblers. Don't be a grumbler. Okay? Live thankfully. Secondly, the false teachers, it says that they are, um, they are finding fault. They find fault with others. That's what the false teachers do. Christians, on the other hand, we praise others for the things they do well. We praise others for the things they do well. False teachers are They try to pick people apart and try to get them to do what they want them to do. Whereas a Christian, Ida, you did such a wonderful job last night with orchestrating all that. We praise people for the things they do. Kevin, worship team, man, y'all did an awesome job this morning. We are so thankful for you guys. But that's the things that we do. We praise people and encourage people to move forward. And we, we give them thanks for what they do. We don't try to find fault with everybody. If you dig, if you dig long and hard enough, you'll find some faults in me, okay? And I'm, and I'm cool with you pointing them out. But also, throw some praise in there too. Help me out. And I'll do the same for you. The next one in verse 16, it says, They are following after their own lust. False teachers follow their lust. They follow the things that their sinful nature gravitates towards. Again, money, sex, power. Whereas the Christian, we crucify. We crucify our sinful desires. We repent of our sinful desires. And we give them to God. And we give them to his grace. And say, Lord, please help me. And then the next one there in verse 16. It says, uh, talking about the false teachers. It says they are arrogant, prideful, and they use people for their own agenda. This ungodly world system uh, and the false teachers and Satan himself, he has an agenda to keep people in darkness and to twist their minds through social media, through the deception, of the, through what they hear on the streets. They, they want to twist people's minds for their own agenda. And it's deadly and it's sweeping across our land like a tidal wave. On the flip side of that, for the Christian, our only motive is that others see Christ in us and want to follow him. I mean, why are you so nice? Why are you so loving? Why are you so caring? Why do you have such a gentle spirit? Because Christ is in me. Because I serve the Lord and he's changed my heart. And there's no arrogance, there's no pride, there's no prejudice. And, and out of that, when people see that, we want them to see Christ. And, but again, think about it, family. When you read verse 16, these, these are the kind of people you don't want to be around. This should be a no-brainer. At least I don't want to be around. Arrogant, prideful, people that use people for their own agenda. We're, I'm not trying to coerce you into my agenda, okay? I'm trying to coerce you into God's agenda, into the, what the Word says in becoming a fully devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we've taken verse 16 apart. Let's move to verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last times there will be mockers following after their ungodly lusts. Verses 17, 18, and 19, Jude is, start, is beginning the transition. He's, he's dealt directly with the false teachers. Now, he's still kind of dealing here with the false teachers, but he's also turning his attention to the believers because he says in verse 17, as he also repeats in verse 20, he says, but you, beloved. Who is the beloved? Christians. Christians who have experienced the love of God, who have been born again, okay? The Bible says you must be born again. You must come to a point in this life where you repent you say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I put my trust in you. Please come into my life, Holy Spirit, and let, uh, uh, make me born again. And when you're born again, you become part 
of the beloved. And it's be loved. If you look it up in the dictionaries, that beloved phrase versus loved phrase, it just means an intense love, a passionate love. And God has an intense, passionate love, friends and family, for your devotion to him. He loves you so much that he went to the cross for you. Okay? He put actions behind his words. And now he demands of us that when we understand the gospel and we surrender our life to him, that we put actions behind our words. And that's what living the Christian life is. Is Lord, I'm going to conform my life to you because, of, because I have been born again and I have put my trust in you. So that's the beloved. And then he says, uh, ought to remember the word. Man, that's a powerful phrase there. Just a, if, you, if you, you just pull it out. He says, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that is a word of wisdom. And it's simply this. Don't remember my words. Remember the words of the apostles. Remember the Bible. Remember the scripture. You know, not, 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 not that my words soak into your heart, but that the word of God soaks into your heart. You know, when you stand before God on judgment day, it's not going to be about Pastor David's words. It's going to be about your response to the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's go back to where he's, what he's talking about, which is in verse 18. He's talking about the apostles were warning that, that ungodly times will come. Look at verse 18. But they were saying to you in the last time, there will be mockers following after their ungodly lust. Mockers, mockers is exactly what that word means. They are, they are mocking. They are making fun of. They are ridiculing. They are laughing at. They are scoffing. What are they laughing and scoffing at? Jesus Christ himself. They laugh and mock and they scoff at the Bible. Failing to remember that Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. They laugh and they mock at judgment. Man, friends and family, if the ungodly world, if they just had one little glimpse into eternity, if they could just see one glimpse into eternity, man, they would fall on their face and they would repent and put their trust in Christ if they knew what was awaiting them, that they will perish on judgment day, that they would spend eternity in hell. Does that word like not feel good when you say it? Same here, but it's true. But it's true. And there's only one thing that can alter and shift their destination from eternity in hell, and that's the cross. And then through the cross have eternity in heaven, but they mock it. And then it says they follow, the verse, end of verse 17, following after their own ungodly lust. In other words, he's saying that these false teachers, not only do they mock Jesus, not only do they mock the Bible, not only do they mock a future judgment, but they are driven by their immorality and their lust. It is the driving force in their life. Not the gospel, not Jesus, not Christianity, not a divine calling, but their sinful nature. Verse 19, he drives this deeper. Family, as you study Jude, again, the book of Jude was written for us to understand the importance of um, identifying false teachers, avoiding false teachers, and running from false teachers, and, and keeping ourselves from falling away. These are very deep, descriptive words that talk about their agenda and who they are on the inside. But verse 19, look at verse 19. He says, these are the ones who cause division. They're worldly-minded, and they're devoid of the Spirit. When I think about that word, causing division, he's talking about basically a false teacher will come in, and they will divide a church. They will split a church. They will pull away people that aren't strong in the faith, okay? These false teachers that cause division, you know what they are? They're like a ticking bomb. And at some point, they're going to explode, and they're going to separate the body of Christ. Now, when you think about that, it's not just within the local church, but it's also across the landscape of Christianity, of churches, okay? They can do that in the context of the local church body 
in Columbia, South Carolina, or they can also do that across the landscape of Christianity across our country. But they cause division. They're like a ticking bomb. Then he says they're worldly-minded. We talked about this a while ago. Worldly-minded, simply they, they think like the world, they live like the world, and they look like the world. They should be very easily identifiable to the Berean, to the person who knows the word and knows the scripture. It, it should be, uh, it's a no-brainer. Got to stay away from those guys. And then it says they are devoid of the Holy Spirit. Look, verse 19, devoid of the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? There's no Holy Spirit in them, okay? Everything that's said and done in church, from the preaching of the word to the praise and worship, to the men's Bible study, to the women's Bible study, to the children's ministry, to, to youth ministry, everything is so important that it's led by the Holy Spirit. That's why as leaders, as teachers, as pastors, we have to be prayed up in the Spirit, as it's going to allude to um, here at the, uh, at the um, next verse. But we got to be led by the Spirit so that the Spirit of God is leading us in ministry. And we are doing things the way the Lord wants us to do them. We don't create this ourselves. We don't invent this on our own. We follow what the Lord leads us to do through his word. So now verse 20. Verse 20 in, um, in Jude. Jude is going to take a right turn. He's going to shift gears. And he's going to say, Christians. Look at the first two words of Jude 20. But you. But you. He, he's making a clear, he's breaking off on his exposition of his teaching of apostasy and false teachers. And now he's directing his attention to the Christian. He says, but you, beloved, talking about the believers, he says, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. How do we build ourselves up in our most holy faith? How do, how do we build ourselves up in our most holy faith? By doing what we're doing right now. By studying the word, studying the scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept, and being on that operating table in the Holy Spirit performing his surgery as we study the word. How do we build ourselves up in our, in our most holy faith? Three ways. Worship, word, and fellowship. Christian, you need that. No matter where you go, no matter what type of church you go to, no matter where you live in this world, the three things that you need is worship, word, and the fellowship. Singing songs of praises to our God and King. And lifting up holy hands and singing from our hearts. And giving him all the praise and all the adoration. That builds, up, builds us up in our most holy faith. When we worship him. That's why we're not just singing songs just to sing songs, okay? We're giving the, 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 the body a chance to worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness before we get into the word. Because that builds you up. Praise and worship, singing songs, builds you up in your most holy faith. Secondly, the word. The word. you got to be in the word. you got to study the word. It will build you up in your most holy faith. And again, we're not just filling our heads with knowledge, but we're filling our hearts with the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can do his surgery. And thirdly, one of my favorites, fellowship. Fellowship. Christian, you got to have fellowship. you got to be, ladies, you need to be, surround yourself with other godly ladies who will love you and minister to you. Men, we got to do the same thing. we got to surround ourselves with fellowship. And when we do those three things, worship, word, and fellowship, I believe what he's talking about in verse 20 will take place. We will build ourselves up in our most holy faith. And then finally, he says, praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, um, praying in the Holy Spirit. We need an extra measure of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can be praying, not according to our will, but according to God's will. We need an extra measure of his Holy Spirit. I pray in the Spirit, and I have a prayer language, and I'm not ashamed of my prayer language, okay? And I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I have a prayer language I call tongues, and I pray fervently in the Spirit in my prayer time for the church, for the body. But, and, but I believe when we pray, when he uses this phrase here, praying in the Holy Spirit, 
He's referring to the Holy Spirit giving us uh, the ability to pray for the things in accordance to the will of God. So in our prayer time, in our prayer language, we need to say, Lord, give me your heart so I can pray. I'm not praying for the big house and the Lamborghini and the big paycheck, but I'm praying for the salvation of souls. I'm praying for my brothers and sisters to be physically healed. I am praying for the things that touch the heart of God, that people's hearts and minds are open. Those are the kind of things that we pray for when we pray in the Holy Spirit. So we need to be praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, in, in, before you pray, send up a pre-prayer prayer and saying, Lord, help me to pray. Help me to pray in the Spirit for the things that are near and dear to your heart. Our prayer life, Holy Spirit, prayer life. Think about that. You know, I'm, I've, I've been guilty of it many times, just sending up a, a heartless, non-emotional, just a quick words off my lips prayer. And, but what we need to do is we need to have a fervency, a groaning, uh, a deep, intimate prayer life where we say, Lord, please move mightily on the thing that we're praying for. Verse 21, he says, keep yourself in the love of God waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Friends and family, if you want to guard yourself from false teaching, apostasy, and falling away, do what Jude says. Keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. How do we keep ourselves in the love of God? How, how do, how do, what does that look like? Look at the second half of the verse waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. You center your life around the gospel. You center your life around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your master. He is your Lord. And you follow him and you follow his word. And when you do that, I believe, you are surrounding yourself. You are keeping yourself in the love of God. Because Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the love of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He is the love of God. And we surround our life with him, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord. You know, we experience mercy at salvation. The slate is wiped clean. We're completely forgiven. We, we've been given mercy instead of judgment. He's wiped us clean and made us pure. But one day we're going to see him face to face when he appears and we have eternal life. Verse 22, he says, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Okay. Do you know anybody? Do you know anybody struggling with their faith? Have you ever struggled with your faith? I have. In my life, I've struggled with the things of faith. I've, I've struggled in understanding who God is and who wrote the Bible and questioning things and not quite understanding everything. If you know someone who is struggling with faith, don't judge them. Don't judge them, okay? Do not judge them. On the contrary, help them. Help them. I've struggled with faith. I've struggled with faith in my life. Wondering, you know, is, is this really true? Can I trust it? Is it reliable? Did it really happen? I've had those kind of thoughts. And every good thinking Christian should. You know, Christianity is not only a religion of our heart where we trust in him, but it's also in our minds. And I think it's very important that we think about the things of theology and then the things that we struggle with, we get help. We ask our pastor. We, we do study, we do research. But let's have mercy friends and family, let's show love and grace to those who are struggling, to those who may experience doubt, and let's encourage them. Don't, don't get all high and mighty and look at me, I'm all this and all that, and I got the perfect faith and you don't. No, that's pride. That's pride, and we don't act like that. We encourage each other. I can tell you some stories. I'm not going to say this. I'm going to say this story for another message, but after, in my early years of Christianity, I went through some serious doubts and, 
and not understanding everything. And God prophetically spoke to, to a friend of mine and gave me a word. It was amazing. I'm going to share it for another day. I'm going to save it for another day. But let's show mercy and love and grace towards those who are struggling with their faith. And let's help them. You know, if you got questions, come to me and ask them. I've had questions too. And if I, I, may, I may or may not have the answer. But if, if I don't have the answer, I'll at least work on trying to find you a good answer. That's all I can give you. Verse 23 he says, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. I love that phrase in verse 23. We're snatching them out of the fire. Friends and family, we are all evangelists. We are all here on this planet to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what you and I are like? We're like firefighters. We're like firefighters. We pull up to the house, the house is on fire, and we know there's people inside the house and the house is going to burn down and they're going to perish. And so what do we do? We go in there to rescue them. We go in there to save them. And we, and we do it with a sense of urgency. We don't go, you, you see a house on fire, you know there's people in there. And you don't go, excuse me, excuse me, can I get y'all just to come out to the house, come out of the house, you know. Do, do, we, do, we, do we approach a house on fire that way? No. We bust that front door down. We go in and we say, hey, dude. Hey, ma'am, family, the house is on fire. You need to get out. You need to get out. Get out of this house. This house is going to collapse. It's on fire. And we're on a rescue mission. And we should have that same sense of urgency and passion towards our unsaved loved ones and our unsaved friends. That brother, sister, neighbor, friend, the truth of the matter is you are not promised tomorrow. Please, while you have breath today, put your trust in Christ. Put your faith in him. Accept his gift of eternal life through the cross. But we're like firefighters and we are here to rescue people to save people from perishing eternity in hell and experiencing the joy of eternity in heaven. And then he says, on some have mercy, on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. That phrase, look at that in verse 23, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. I think that's where Christians, this, this may be where Christians get the phrase, we, we, we love the sinner and we hate the sin. But that is true. That is absolutely true. We love all people. There, there's no category of people. There's no uh, activity of sin that people are involved in where we don't love them. We love all people. But as Christians, we hate what sin has done in their life. We hate the sin. We hate the deeds. And we have the solution to the sin. We have the way that they can be forgiven, and that is through the gospel. But we love all people, but we hate the garments polluted by the flesh. In other words, we hate what the fall has brought into this world. The sin, the consequences, everything, we hate it. But we love the people at all times. We love them and care for them. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> sometimes people accuse Christians of being unloving because of the positions we hold, but actually it's on the contrary. The greatest love you could have for someone is if you see them doing something wrong and you have the courage to go to them in a spirit of grace and a spirit of truth and say, listen, I'm here to help you. I'm here to show you that that is sin. That is the greatest act of love, friends and family, that we can show this world is to show them the truth of the gospel, to show them that Jesus loves them, that Jesus cares for them, and that he died to set them free. So we were a firefighter. We snatched them out of the fire. And then we, uh, we hate even the garments polluted by the flesh. We, we love them, but we, but, we, but we sit back with spiritual vision and we see what sin has done to the world and, and it, it makes us upset at what sin has, how sin has corrupted everything. Let's look at verse 24. 
Verse 24, I'm going to hover here just for a minute because I love this phrase here in verse 24. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. I love that phrase. I underlined it on the, on the screen so you can see it. It says, now to him who is able. Do you believe that God is able? Do you believe that he's able to do everything he has said he will do? Romans chapter 4 verse 21 says this. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Are you fully, this is faith, family. Are you fully convinced that God will do what he said he's going to do in his word? That's what faith is, is being completely convinced that God is able. And he is. Paul's taught in Romans chapter 4, he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Friends and family, we can live with a deep conviction that God's word is true and he will do everything he says he will do. We can have a convinced heart, we can have a convinced mind, and we can have a convinced life that God is able. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, uh, Paul uses this phrase again. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Do you believe that God is able to do far more abundantly than the, beyond all that we ask or think? God hears our prayers, and when our prayers are in accordance with his will and we're asking him, we can have faith that he will answer. Okay? This is a faith thing. When we say that God is able, it's a faith thing. It's where you put your feet firmly on the ground, on the word of God, and you stand and you say, I see what's going on around me, but God is able to do immeasurably more than we think or ask. And we are completely convinced of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says, he uses this phrase again. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. That verse, I ask you, thinking about God is able, is God enough? Is God enough? And I hope we say with a resounding uh, spirit that yes, God is enough. God is enough. He can make Look at, look at verse 8. Look at it. It says, he can make some grace abound to you. Is that what it says? No, it says he can make all grace. He is enough. He is sufficient. He can take care of you and, and take care of your life. And you can trust him for everything in life. For this physical life, for, for this, your spiritual life, for the life to come, for your children, for your family. You can trust him because he is able. He, I'm going to keep on for a little bit more. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18 says, uh, For because he himself has suffered when, te- when, excuse me, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is a big question right here. Do you believe God is able to help you in your hour of temptation? You know, anybody struggling with sin? Anybody got any areas of their life they need help with in their areas of growing and sanctification? There's areas of, in our life that we struggle with obedience. You know, I'm here to tell you, based on Hebrews 2.18, the Lord Jesus Christ is able. He is able to help you in your area of your temptation. Okay? He can help you overcome the things of this world. He is able chapter 2 verse 18 he is able to help those who are being tempted but in order for him to help us we got to put our eyes on him we got to put our eyes on Christ and, and, and say Lord please help me in this hour please help me in this area I'm struggling with and then, and then he may direct you he may direct you to a Bible verse he may direct you to a brother or a sister in Christ who can hold you accountable 
He will direct you. He will help you in this area of temptation. And the final, he is able. Hebrews 7.25, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. I love this. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. That, that word uttermost in verse 25, it means completely. It means to the end. Do you believe that God can save you to the uttermost, to the end, completely, through and through? He will take you all the way from the cradle to the day you step into eternity. He will take care of you completely and utterly to the end, to the uttermost, as long as you draw near to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is right now, this very moment that we're breathing and looking at the text and you're looking up at this guy up here on the stage. The Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven and he's making intercession for you and I. He's praying to the Father for us. Friends and family, this fra- oh, go back to verse 24 in our text of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless without great joy. God, this is, this is important. This is, I'm closing here. God and God alone through his word is able to keep you and I from false teaching, to keep you and I from apostasy, and to keep you and I from falling away. And all, all you know, we have a responsibility, okay? You know that old phrase, let go and let God? You ever heard that phrase? That, that's, not, that's not in the Bible, okay? We, we have a, res- look back at verse 20. I want to go back there real quick. But you, beloved, he says in verse 20, building yourself, okay? He's saying we, we, we have a responsibility, to build ourselves. And that responsibility is just keeping your eyes on Christ, keeping your eyes on the Lord. But when we keep our eyes on the Lord, when we make that conscious decision, we can have confidence that God is able in all situations of life and bringing it back into our study, keep us from false teaching, apostasy, and falling away. This is the story of the Bible. That's the story of the Bible. That God is able. That God is able when we keep our hearts focused on him. He is faithful even when we are faithless. That is the beautiful message of scripture. So many times in life we we see a situation and um, things aren't going the way we want them to go in an area of our life or someone in our family, or whatever, and, and, we, and, and, and it's disheartening. But we have to rise above the disheartenment and say, with faith, God is able. God is able. Because that's the story of the scriptures, the story of redemption, and the story that God is able. Our final verse this morning, verse 25, and we'll wrap up the book of Jude. He says, to the only God, our Savior, Through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. He concludes this book on false teachers, apostasy, and the dangers of it with doing the same thing I will do to you guys this morning, pointing you to the one who has all authority, all dominion, and all majesty, and all glory, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Put your trust in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Christianity is about about our hearts. It's it's, it's, it's It's always been a heart issue. And I pray that this morning that... um, because this, everything's about a heart issue with you and I, that the great physician has done surgery on your heart this morning and given you some truth, given you some nuggets for you to go home and, and think about. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, 
and forever. Put your trust in Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the book of Jude. Thank you for the awesome things that we've learned in this book over the past three weeks, Lord. And Father, the greatest way we can protect and guard our hearts from apostasy and false teaching is, is, is staying in your word and loving you with all of our hearts. So Lord, let, let, that, be our, our, let that be our heart, that, that we love you, trust you, and commit our lives to living for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, Father. Amen.